Uh, as Nikki said, we are in week two of a series called You Asked For It, where basically uh, we've been talking about things you've asked for. And so uh, it's, it was exciting to hear just uh, how they kind of enjoyed it last week. I heard a lot of great comments uh, about people enjoying it. And so um, excited to be able to get into that again. Just a reminder, if you have a question that you want answered, uh, can't promise it, but please submit it. Whenever you see a QR code on the screens in the back, you can scan that, submit a question. All these have come from you guys. And so um, I'm excited to be able to share some time with these guys again. As much as I love you all, I'm going to do a disclaimer on our behalf, as Pastor Guy did last week. I love them to death, uh, but we are not experts. Uh, far from it. I think we are just guys that love Jesus, and uh, we're just trying to answer important questions. And I think it's awesome that you guys have been asking those questions. Um, and then just a reminder, like, conversation doesn't have to stop here. This is something I know a lot of our groups just sit around a coffee table at Starbucks or whatever, and they're talking. And so a little shameless plug there to get connected to a group if you're not. Uh, and uh, we got a ton of great men's groups that meet. Uh, men, let me hear you. Don't, 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 uh, don't shame me. Men, let me hear you in the room. Hey. That was a good one. That was a good one for the first try. I had to give a disclaimer because normally it's like crickets when I say that. Uh, just a reminder, men, you get to hang out with these guys at Men's Retreat. Uh, May 2nd through the 4th if you sign up. And this is what we do. We hang out. We talk. We have great conversation. We play dominoes. And so if y'all really want it, come find me at Men's Retreat and I'll show you how to play dominoes. Uh, but uh, we're, let's get into um, answering uh, some questions here. And uh, this first one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss to PG. Um, I, I, I listened out for the men. but So ladies, let me hear you in the room. Ooh. They always put us to shame. Guys, we got to do better. We got to do better, guys. Well, a uh, shout out to the ladies. They're, they're always amazing. And honestly, y'all need to sign the men up because you can see, you know, sometimes we need your help in that way. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss this one to PG. I'm assuming it was written by, by one of our ladies, but maybe not. I don't know. Uh, PG, here's the question. It says, do, does Oasis allow women to lead at church? That's a question that's asked very often, usually from a certain perspective that a person is asking it, and there's a lot of perspectives there. It's absolutely obvious that yeah. women are leaders at Oasis uh, from day one. However, I think this question really, and we don't have time because I know you guys cut two-thirds of my answer out when we went over it, uh, be, so that you could answer your question. You're welcome. But <laughs> in our culture today, uh, the role of the woman is really under attack. I, I've, I'm old enough to have watched to see how far women have come in our culture, in our country, uh, in my lifetime, which is... Uh, honestly, incredibly good because uh, the Bible has always uplifted and honored women in all aspects, and women have always been a major part of God's plan and has esteemed them, and I'm glad culture has been catching up. Unfortunately, because roles are being reversed and there's all kind of an attack on the genders today and all of those things, uh, it's sad to me that I think the the role of the woman is under attack and really endangered. But I'm happy to say it's not in the church. Uh, I know at Oasis, and I have a perspective since I've been here since day one, from day one in our original core group, uh, which Judy Goodwin was a part of, my mom was, my wife was, uh, once we became a real church uh, in a sense of an organized, uh, constitutionally organized church uh, my wife and mother stepped off. But our council, which is the highest voted on uh, group in our church that works with me in administrative ways, is uh, occupied by men and women. Uh, council chairpersons have been women uh, over the years uh, a number of times. Uh, we really don't choose one way or the other there. Uh, small groups are led by women. Worship is led by women. We've had women on our executive team, uh, staff team. Uh, over the years, they've been on our teaching team. We, we have uh, a woman that is uh, on our part-time teaching team now that you heard uh, about three or four weeks ago, Jackie. 
And so it, within the church, we're only following the edification and the inclusion of women like Jesus did in all his ministry, uh, Paul did in his ministry, and God created it that way in the Old Testament. However, there's one area that I get the most questions about, and it's the one area that has a role that God laid out for men, one, one role, and it's of pastor. And that can be very controversial today when people want to change everything to fit them. But we base what we do as close as possible in Scripture. Sometimes it's principle, sometimes it's example over history. But then many times it's black and white in Scripture. And while this has been questioned, this particular role is not black and white, and it's the role of the pastor. And there are several places in the New Testament where the writer, predominantly Paul, uh, wrote this as he was laying out, and this particular one is in 1 Timothy, the roles in the church, uh, because the church is just like a family. Remember that. God uh, has the church and the physical family just set up the same way. And you see that throughout the New Testament. Now, there's not a lot of guidelines that are left us, so we have a lot of latitude to how we worship. Last week, I mentioned we worship in spirit and truth. But the apostle was very, very clear when he was teaching and training Timothy here and talking to the early church in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. He said, now the overseer, which the overseer was the pastor, in other uh, translations it'll say pastor, must be above reproach, and the husband of but one wife. Now, he goes on and sets a lot of other stuff there. Now, there's no way to culturally uh, or preference-wise change that. God made two genders. Now, regardless of what's going on in culture, God made two genders, okay? You can say you're one. I can say I'm a woman. I could try to do everything I can to make myself look, I'd be the ugliest woman in the world, but make myself look like a woman, okay? But that doesn't change what God set out, and we follow his standard. And so it's very clear here, uh, he didn't say, let them be the wife of but one husband. He said that very clearly and didn't change it. Jesus could have changed that, Paul could have changed that, uh, because even though the culture put down women, and in a lot of the cultures at that time, women weren't even considered 100% human. That wasn't so with Jesus and with Paul and the mm -hmm. church. The women had always been elevated by them. Yep. So if Jesus had wanted to change that or say that or lead Paul to say that after he was gone, they could have done it because they were considered radical with women. Yep. I mean, women, they, they elevated women when the whole culture put them down. And I don't know what the reason was that, that he made that s distinction so clear because most of the church organization wasn't that clear. First, or Titus, not first Titus, the only Titus, uh, also did the same thing in verse six. An elder must be blameless, a husband of one wife. And so that was like right at the top of the list. And so God made that. He spoke through Paul. Paul made that. And so that's the only rule, the only role. Regardless, I know some people say, well, churches do that. They, churches can do whatever they want to do, okay? Uh, I'm just saying we're trying to uh, live by specifically what the Bible says. And when it's silent or it's gray, then we have the right to change that. We don't in that one role. Okay, uh, now, three or four weeks ago when Jackie was here, we've had ladies teach from the platform for, from the time we began the church, you go, well, why do you do that? And someone uh, in one of the services sent me a note through the connection card, and they, they said, you know, uh, women aren't to be teaching, and they gave me this verse, 1 Timothy chapter 2, and, it's, and Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. She must be silent. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
However, if you, if you study this, there could have been any number of reasons that Paul said that, even going back to the family roles. However, most theologians and commentators that I have read after, because I've studied this, because I don't want to ever be out of the protection and umbrella of what God wants, mm -hmm. is in that early church, Paul was very biased here because that church was operating coming out of the Old Testament where women and men worshiped in the same room, but they were separated. Yeah. Remember, they were only considered half people outside the church, okay? So they were still struggling with the culture. Well, they also didn't worship like us where you have one major teacher in a service because our services look very different. And so in there, they would have teachers, but anyone would stand up and they would start talking. And there's many times in scripture where it talks about that in the New Testament. And they would all be talking, men, women alike. Well, in that particular early church, one particular one, and you can look it up. I, they took this out of my notes because I don't have time, okay? Uh, <laughs> there are two women that Paul very specifically, don't even ask me their names because I'll butcher their names. You can go look it up. They were fighting. They were causing division in the church. It, it appeared to be that it was public in the public services. And so Paul had enough and he goes, shut up and go home and talk to your husband about that. Okay. And only Paul could have said it that way. He probably would have. Okay. And so when Paul said this, Paul did not say like where it distinctly showed the roles. He didn't say that here. He said, I... This was his personal thing that he was saying. There's, there's flexibility there, okay? And so theologians believe that that was the biggest thing. He was trying to correct a local church issue at the time. And so that's what he was saying. But I, he did not say, I command all the church. Or many places he commanded it. It was very clear with the roles of pastor, but here it wasn't. And so that same person that would say, ha ha, you shouldn't have a woman on the platform teaching, is the same person that will applaud the woman that gets up here and tells her testimony. And the testimony is teaching. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and when women come up here and lead worship as they did today. Yep. Is there anything more sacred than worship? Okay? Women are leading. But that same person has no problem with that. So that's being inconsistent. So uh, I'm going to leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> now that's good. And, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk to men real quick. As a man, I'm going to talk to men straight because I can. Um, you know, John Maxwell, he has a book on five levels of leadership and he talks about the, the lowest, easiest level being you coming with your title and just kind of saying, Hey, and that's in the workplace anywhere. Hey, you need to follow me cause I'm your boss and I'm your leader. And I think there's a lot of men who probably uh, would speak to their wife or speak to a woman in your life that way. Um, just kind of catering to the title. You got to follow me cause I'm a man, but really they're not worth following. Um, I think as you grow in leadership, you realize that one of the deeper levels of leadership is influence and that a person is going to willingly follow somebody they can trust, right? So I think a lot of men, y'all just aren't worth following. You're not good leaders, right? And so you turn around, nobody's following you, and then you're mad about that. Um, and so I, I will say this, men, you just, we, we got to step up and be the leaders that God has called us to be. Amen. Um, and so, and, but at the same time, I praise God for women who have said, you know what, if you're not going to raise our kids in the ways of the Lord, then step out the way, I'm, I'll do it. Or, you know, if you're not going to cover our house in prayer, then get out the way and I'll do it. And, um, I praise God for women who have stepped up to fill that void when men have refused to, but it, it saddens me. It grieves me that men have kind of just abdicated that role in society. Yeah. And, and you talk about women leading in that area and like my, my background is from that. I have a mom that, because my dad, was not the spiritual leader or my stepfather was not the spiritual leader that's a man that's leading in the house that he should have been, my mom had to step in that gap and do it, you know? Yeah. And thank God for that. I would not be here today because of that. Yeah, if it not, were not for that, you know? Yep. And I think going back to what PG said about um, like women teaching, women in a council, right? That, a lot of that, and you mentioned this during the week, but it comes from the, the authority that you have to be able to put people in certain places, right? With the regards to the council, right? We vote them in, and that's a whole other thing. If you don't know about our church council, we, we're beheld a lot to what, what they say. So the fact that a woman is leading even there, that speaks yeah. to a lot. But when I think of authority like that, I think of like when my mom was in the military, right? She was a, a captain in the military, so she's an officer. 
So she has authority, but that authority only came from people that were higher up, right? It was not based on who she was or the fact that she was a woman or the fact that uh, she had certain capabilities or whatever. It's based on the authority that someone else gave the person above her to say, hey, look, we're giving you this authority here. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, to be able to drive, uh, see my mom drive around the base and people had to salute her and do all those things, it was really cool as a kid <laughs> to see that. And so I think that when we talk about women in the church, it's almost kind of the same thing. Good, good analogy. Uh, Colin, I want to hear from you because what I love is that we're, we're, we don't know it all, but when we try to seek is through scripture. That's where we find our answers. And it's, as you can see, here's an example of, we don't know it, but let's turn to scripture and try to find the answer. And that's okay. When you guys have conversations with people, it's okay to say, I don't know, but you know what? Let's open the Bible. Let's figure it out together. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've been told the wrong thing because they were scared to say I didn't know. Uh, but here's a question that we've gotten is how do we even interpret scripture and how do we interpret scripture specifically that seem to contradict themselves? Yeah, so uh, again, scripture is important. Scripture is kind of the baseline, the foundation of what we believe. We just talked about it just now where we looked at two scriptures that seem to contradict themselves, but we kind of looked at it a little bit deeper to understand the context around it so that we can better prepare an answer for these contradictions that people point out. And uh, in that question that was asked, they actually gave the answer to themselves. They said, how do we interpret scripture that seems to contradict themselves? And then after that, they put another question, is context the key? The answer is yes. Uh, context <laughs> yeah. is the key. I've said it on here on stage before. Um, context is king when it comes to understanding scripture. But I don't think we even talk enough about what context we should be looking for. Um, so I wanted to make it very, very simple again. Um, the, we learned this in elementary school. The who, the what, the where, the when, and the why. And I think it's the same when we read our scriptures. Are we looking for the who? And when I say who, uh, the Bible is written by 40 different authors. And, and not only that, they're written to multiple different people. So the, uh, one of the foundational beliefs when it comes to scriptures is found in, again, Timothy, another great book. Uh, but 2 Timothy, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 16. This is what it says. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. There's this idea, when it talks about how Scripture is God-breathed, that means all 40 of those authors were led through the Holy Spirit, all of them. So there, there shouldn't be any contradictions if the Holy Spirit's leading it, because we don't serve a God of, of confusion. Yeah. Um, so although, although there's 40 different authors over 1,500 different years, um, they all are, are connected by this one Holy Spirit that's moving in them as they write. But again, it's also important who they're writing to. Because we understand that there was books that was written to the kingdom of Israel. Even when we look at the gospel books, when you look at the gospel of, of Matthew, it was mainly written uh, to Jewish readers. When you look at the gospel of Mark, it was mainly written to Roman leaders. And those sort of stuff help us understand a lot more context. So we got the who as far as who wrote it, who are they writing to. But then there's also this question of what type of writing style even is this? Again, the Bible is a collection of all these other books. There's books that are poetic. There's books that are historic, which just contain a lot of facts. There's books that are just books of wisdom. Um, so when you look at these different literary things, it's kind of like when you're in school, you're not going to read a science book the same way you read a, a, po a poetry book or an English book. And it's the same way when we read scripture. And that'll help us understand the why. Because if we're reading a book like, like Exodus, where it's a very historic book, it's one of those history books that we have, those are pretty much just listing out a lot of facts that honestly don't really apply to us. There's not a very applicable verses in Exodus. Whereas if you jump to a book like Proverbs, there's a lot of wisdom in there where it is very practical things that we can apply to our lives. And then there's even the questions of when was this written? Uh, last week, Pastor Guy again pointed out a really good job of when you look at the Old Testament, they were under the Old Covenant. When you look at the New Testament, there's this new covenant of grace. So as you look at all this context and uh, you understand where it's written and how it's written, it helps you understand how to apply it a little bit better. And to give you guys an example of this and why this is so important, um, again, I'm on TikTok just trying to keep up with these young kids. <laughs> and what happens is you see these crazy people say these crazy things about scripture on TikTok. And I saw this video of this guy who said that Ephesians chapter 21 uh, showed that God was promoting genocide and rape and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, if you don't know, Ephesians only has six chapters. Um, so first thing there, 
Um, but then he corrected himself and he said, actually, I was talking about Judges 21. <laughs> and if you know anything about the book of Judges, it's this story of how God's people are always, they, they trusted him. God, we trust you. We love you. We love you. And then now we're going to do our own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that story, the, the kind of last verse in that whole book of Judges that summarizes the whole story is, is in Judges 21, verse 25. It says, in those days, Israel had no king. And everyone did as they saw fit. Yeah. There's this idea of when you read the book of Judges and you see all the evil that's happening in that book, it's because us as humans were, or they were doing what they wanted to do as humans. They weren't listening to God who should have been their king. So you see there where if you don't truly understand the context of, of books and the whole view of these books, sometimes they can lead to a lot of improper um, interpretations of scripture. So it's important that we do our part to, to make sure we're looking for that context as much as possible. And there's plenty of resources that I'm sure these guys will share as well too that help us through that uh, PG Menton commentaries that, that go a long way. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things that I just I'm doing Bible reading in a year, and I just got through Judges like last week. And Judges is it is important to realize things like that. The difference between descriptive and prescriptive mm-hmm. text. Yeah. Sometimes the Bible is just describing what is happening and not necessarily condoning that behavior. So when you read crazy things and you think, "Oh my gosh, God's condoning it," no, He's just describing what was going on at that time. It's important to realize those things. Um, I really love um, it, it, Blue Letter Bible. Yeah. It's a really great resource. I know some of us use it on the platform. Those who teach at our students on Thursdays, which you'll hear from them in two weeks. Yep. Uh, so really excited to hear from those who are teaching our middle school and high schoolers. Uh, use that resource too. Uh, you can use an app. You can use the website. Uh, it's called Blue Letter Bible. Um, and it's a great resource. It has commentaries, um, concordance. You can see the original language and see what that means. The idea of when we read love in English, which love is that? Is that phileo or agape? And what is the difference between those two words in love? One is brotherly and one is... So it's, it's just important to really dive into the text and get the context of those things. Yeah, and oh, sorry, PG, my bad. Um, going on that too, I think a, a really good resource I think a lot of people look over is their own Bible. Like what kind of Bible are you using? Yeah. There's the life application Bible. There are study Bibles that literally, if you look at the bottom of the page, will tear apart. And that sounds bad, but you know what I mean? Like will flesh out. That's a better way to there put that. Yeah. Yeah. Flesh out, um, what you're reading so that you have context with what's going on. Maybe this word sounds weird. Down there, they explain what that word is. It has maps in the back. So you have the regional context of everything that's happening in what you're reading. So if you don't have one, and if you're not going to go through the concordance, like uh, any of those things, get a study Bible, man. It's super, super helpful when you're reading scripture. Bible Gateway, uh, where you can read through the Bible in a year, also has commentaries and all kinds of helps there, and they're all good, solid ones. Some are free, some you can buy, and also version, which is, I believe, the most popular in the world, where you read the Bible, but it also has a listing down the side where you can look up good, solid commentaries and other theological books to be able to help with that. Yeah, yeah. I think this is something probably that is helpful. The sooner you learn this, the better. In your Christian walk, I think a lot of early new Christians are asking this question, how do I, how do I read the Bible correctly and interpret it correctly? But one of the other things I hear, and it was a question we received, is not only how do I read the Bible correctly, but how do I discern God's voice? And specifically, they said, how do I know if it's just God or if it's me? And so, Lewis, I want to toss this question to you and get your thoughts on this. Yeah, so it's already hard enough to kind of discern that when we live in such a noisy world, right? We have social media, we have the news, we have everyone that we hang out with. And if you're anything like me, um, the inside of your head is a lot noisier than what it is outside. (laughs) And so um, it gets kind of hard to say, like, man, am I being led by what I want to do? Am I making decisions based off of me? Or am I making decisions based off of what God is showing me, what he's telling me? And, and so I think that when we come to these decisions, whether it's a new business decision, right? You're, you're getting uh, involved with a new business partner. Uh, maybe it's a new job that you're deciding whether you should take up or not. Or maybe for some of us, it's that new relationship that you're about to start or you're about to end. You know how many times I've heard, man, God's telling me that I shouldn't be with you or this and that and whatever. <laughs> you, just, you could just tell him you don't like him. It's fine. We don't got to use that. Um, 
But so when it's cut to stuff like this, it's how do, how do I know whether I'm making these decisions based off of God or based off of what I'm trying to tell myself? And yeah. there are a few things that I think um, will help us realize and discern whether or not we're making these decisions. And the first one is, does it align with God's word? Yeah. I think that's the first thing is that does this align with what God, his word, what he's telling me in his written word is, is, is saying and allowing. And uh, if you go to 1 John 4, 1, it says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. The simple truth is that God is not going to tell you something that contradicts what's written in his word. Yep. Right? Come on. You know how many times I've heard people, uh, and again, men, TikTok, um, huh? have said <laughs> to their wives that God is telling me to divorce you. Ooh. It's not God, homie. That's, that's you, dog. It's intrusive thoughts. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? God doesn't contradict himself. Yeah. Not at yeah. all. Going back to context, what, what Colin is saying, there's, it's not contradictory. He doesn't contradict himself. Is are you, are you studying what he's saying? Do you know what he's saying? And again, going back to TikTok or social media, where we, unfortunately, if we're like millennial or Gen Zers, we get a lot of our theological information from, I could tell you firsthand that a lot of that stuff started pointing me the wrong way when I was struggling for a little bit with God. It's not in God's word, it's, it's not what he said. That's yeah. just plain and simple. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I think will help us discern is, uh, is this gonna bring you closer to God or is it gonna bring you further away from him? Um, in, in John 15, uh, for Jesus is saying to remain in me as also I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. And what Christ is saying here is that in every single thing we do, whether literally down to the, the minute decisions that we make, even like the most trivial seeming decision that you can make is that you have to make these decisions based off of whether you're going to get closer to God from it or if it's going to take you further away from it and what this looks like and and I'm going to be completely honest man I feel like I'm just being just being honest today it's good if, yeah yeah you know yeah yeah uh if you are not actively spending time with God, you are not going to be able to discern whether that's his voice talking to you yeah. or if that's your own voice. Yep. If you are not praying every day, if you are not getting in his word every day, how can you dare say that what you're thinking of is coming from God when you don't even know who he is? Yeah. You have not spent out a minute with him, right? Bring the heat. Now... Again, even, even I remember having conversations with people like, um, man, I, I feel like God's trying to tell me to take this job. Well, is this going to take you further from him depending on what the job is? Because there are some jobs, even some that I've had to do where I've quit literally because of stuff that they've told me I've had to do. Yeah. And I said, this yeah. is going to take me further away from what my walk with God should look like. So I'm just going to chuck the deuces and go, right? And I think the last thing, this decision going to require faith and dependence on God, or am I going to be able to just do it by myself? I think that the, the decisions that we make oftentimes that come from God will put us in positions to where we have nothing that we're able to do but to rely on him. And going back to that verse that I shared last week in Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 3, right? It says, lean not in your own understanding. Trust, with, trust the Lord with all your heart, for he'll make your paths straight. Um, it's human nature for us to put our, our faith, our trust in something. Uh, and nine times out of ten, we put our trust in ourselves. And um, when we go back to this verse here, what Solomon is saying is that um, it's, it's this utter surrendering of everything you have unto God. And when you look in the Hebrew in, in, this, in this context here, when we talk about trust, it literally means lying face down on the floor, waiting for, for God to happen. And, and a lot of times when we think of context like this, we think of when um, armies would conquer somewhere, another territory, and in a, an act of surrendering, people would lay just face down, right? And what happens is, is that you can't see what's happening. You don't know if this person is going to pick you up or put a sword in your back. Yeah. And I think that that's the same kind of posture that we have to have with God. He's obviously not going to put a sword in our back. That's, <laughs> I think, 
very clear. Yeah. Uh, every time that I've trusted God, he's lifted me up. So yeah. um, I think that, again, if, if it's not in his word, if it's not bringing you closer to him and it's depending on you, chances are it's not God telling you that. Good. I want to add just one thing because um, I think this is important too. We take into account why the church body is also important because mm. um, we talk about the, the Bible all talks about seeking counsel. Um, and if you're not, mm-hmm. if you don't have godly people around you who know scripture, mm-hmm. man, it's, it's so much harder. So I just wanted to add that. But he, what he just said was fire. That's enough said. Yeah. I just want to add counsel. Counsel church mm-hmm. body is important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, uh, we're wrapping up. I got one last question and it's, it's the hardest one. And, um, uh, <laughs> I did that to myself. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Um, it's a question I'm sure a lot of you asked at some point in your life. You're probably constantly asking. I've asked this. How could a God of love allow suffering? Why does he allow bad things to happen if he supposedly has control over the world? This is a question, <clears throat> a question that rocked me mm-hmm. when I was five and my dad gets diagnosed with a terminal disease and you know, my, my dad loves God, our family loves God, we attend church, and then the doctors say, you got seven years to live, and if the disease doesn't kill you, the amount of drugs we're pumping in you is going to. And so from five years old till the day I could, you know, we're just constantly every day praying, God, heal him, heal him, heal him, heal him, heal him. He doesn't, and um, by the way, I'm going to fast forward. My dad's still alive today. He's sick, but he's alive. He beat their diagnosis. But, but you know, the reality, and praise God for that, but like, you know, I still is like having to watch my dad be sick every day of my childhood and having to endure that. I'm sure you guys have asked that, the things we see. Um, a lot of you know probably Steve Jobs. is. I mean, he's he changed the world. He was an uh, Apple founder and just did crazy things. But what a lot of people probably don't know is it was, it was this exact question that led Steve Jobs to lose, that he walked away from the Christian faith. And so Steve Jobs dies at a relatively early age, like his mid-50s or something like that. And so they released a biography, I think two or three weeks um, after he died. It turned around really quickly. And they tell a story of, of Steve. Um, and they, they said that uh, in July 1968, so Life magazine had published uh, a magazine showing, uh, it was the title said, Starving Children of the Biafra War. And uh, yeah, we have it on the screens there. And in the biography, they talk about Steve Jobs. He takes this magazine and he brings it to Sunday school at church that day. And he goes to his pastor and he says, Pastor, if I lift a finger behind my back, will God know which finger I'm lifting before I do it? And the pastor says, like, yeah, of course. God knows everything. And so Steve literally pulls this magazine out. And he says, and he says well, does God know about this? And does he know about what's going to happen to these children? Right? And the pastor says, Steve, I, I know you don't get it, but yes, God knows about those children. And it was that day that Steve, right there, announced, I want nothing to do with that God. And just completely walks away from that entire thing. And, and I think the reality of suffering is nothing new. Right, Steve knew it then. We know it now. Job knew it. Thousands of years ago, Job Job chapter 14, verse 1, it literally says, a man who was born of a woman is few days and full of trouble. Job Job knew that. And and so our question is always, I mean, we we know that evil and suffering is there, but our question is why? And a lot of people have always searched for those answers. So in in the story of Job, his friends think they have the answer. And so they're blaming Job, and you must have did this, you must have did that. And God basically rebukes them and says they're wrong. And, and, and then centuries later, when you have Jesus, you have the Pharisees and the disciples, and they see people, and they're trying to explain it. And Jesus basically rebukes them, too, and says, no, you're wrong. But notice in both stories, the answer's never really given. It's like, hey, that's not it. And it stops there. And so... Um, one of the guys who has really helped to get me through my wrestling of faith is a great author named Philip Yancey. He wrote some amazing books, one of them being Disappointment with God, uh, which I've been rereading after our recent loss, of just turning back to those truths. Another one he wrote is Where is God When It Hurts? A great, great author. Here's what he writes, and I quote, he says, two things, however, I believe with near certainty. First, we live on a broken planet that displeases God as much as it displeases us. 
And here's what he says, and I quote, my second belief follows from the first. God is on the side of the sufferer. Almost instinctively, we react to suffering by thinking we must have done something wrong for which God is punishing us. And he goes on to say, simply follow Jesus through the gospels and watch his response to a widow who lost her only son or even a Roman soldier whose servant has fallen ill. Never does he blame the victim or philosophize about the cause. Always without exception, he responds with compassion, comfort, and healing. So suffering happened then, suffering happens now. What is God's response to our suffering? That's, that's my question right now. And I, I turn to 2 Corinthians um, chapter uh, 2, verse 4. Here's what he, actually, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. The Apostle Paul is referring to the God of all comfort. Here's what he says. He's talking about the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles. And then I underline this part. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So what, what he's saying there is the church should be the response to pain and to suffering. And so when somebody asks the question, where is God when it hurts? The real question should be, where was the church? The church should be, our, our, what, what, she, what we should be is the response to pain. We are one of the solutions to a world of pain and suffering. And so when, when there is that, I, I kind of ask myself, like, where was I when, when my friend was going through it and was dealing with suffering and pain? Where were us as Christ followers? How were we Jesus' hands and feet in a response to, to pain? Because that, that's one of the solutions is we're supposed to step up and comfort people with the, the comfort that God has, has given us. It really is, and I know some of you are disappointed, but it really is a non-answer answer. <clears throat> there, are some questions that, there are some questions that are going to be left unanswered until we get to heaven. And, and you're just going to have to sit with that reality is that we're going to have to tr yeah, trust and say, God, I, I just I have got to trust your heart right now. And, and the reality is, I've kind of just settled in this idea of, man, I, we're just, we live in a broken world. Yeah. We were never promised a perfect world, at least here. Um, and so, you know, back in the day when I was still angry with God, and I just kind of imagined, like, God had turned his back on me. That's how I had felt. Like, okay, you created everything, you, you, now this situation is here, and you don't care. And maybe that's how some of you feel today. And what I've learned is I've just as I've, I've read those books and studied scripture, is that God really does care. God is like, God is the perfect parent. You remember when you would teach your kids how to ride their bikes, mm -hmm. right? And it involved them potentially falling and getting hurt and scratches and bruises. And when you kind of let go of the, of the chair finally, the seat, you're like, go ahead, go ahead. It, you didn't just turn around and walk in the house. Bye, have fun. <laughs> Right? You were there the whole time just watching, uh, 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 but you were, you were purposely restraining your own power. Why? So that they could learn. Because you knew, man, I had so many amazing memories when I finally learned how to ride my bike. At, man, but when we don't allow the kids to learn that, which comes with bruises and scratches, we rob them of the experience of the joy of really living life. And so God restrains himself to allow us the freedom to be able to really enjoy life. But guess what? That, that is the gospel story. God has allowed us the freedom to live life. And there's going to be pain and hardship. Sometimes you're going to fall. Sometimes you're going to make mistakes. Um, but the, the importance is to realize that God has not left, that he hasn't turned his back, that he's there attentively watching you. And, and it's to understand that in life, we're going to make mistakes. Evil is here in this world because of sin. And Romans uh, tells us that all of us have sinned. All of us fall short of the glory of God. And because of that, sin has entered the world. And with that, evil. Evil is in this world because we've sinned and we've chosen that. And God is just allowing us to live life. But here's my hope. Here's what I turn to is the verse that, that I remember. I was a teenager. I tell you guys all this about, about this all the time. I was a teenager, and I heard this first, and I had read it before, but this day it clicked differently, and I just responded that day. I thought, well, God has forgotten about me. He doesn't care about my dad. He doesn't care about my pain. He doesn't care that I'm suffering. 
This verse, Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. I learned what God was looking forward to. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4 says, and he will wipe away. This is, talks about when everything's done, the rapture, the church is raptured, all this, and God brings his people, and we're now in heaven. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed. This verse reminded me that God is waiting for that day with anticipation where he can finally embrace us and say, you did it. You did it. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You did it. You, you fell. You got scratched and bruised. But here, and he wipes away our tears. He says, it's different now. We're in heaven. And you're not going to have to suffer anymore. There won't be pain. And there won't be crying. And so that is the day that I look forward to. Where I can leave this broken, messed up world and spend eternity in bliss in God. Um, with God in heaven. And that is the goal. That is what God desires for each and every one of us. And so maybe there's somebody in here who, um, who you're like dealing with this world and, and, but there's like no hope for the future. What happens after I die? The reality is, is that God wants to give you that hope too. And what it requires is you acknowledging uh, that there was somebody that paid the price for your mistakes. We've all made mistakes. It's why evil is here in this world. And the Bible says that the, the wages of sin is death. It's eternal separation from God. But God sent his son, Jesus, to live the life that we could never live and to die the death we deserved. He paid the price so that we could go to heaven. So I want to invite you. We're going to wrap up in just a moment. I want to invite you just to bow your heads. If there's anybody here today who is hearing that news for the first time and maybe you want to respond to that news, I want to give you an opportunity. Um, I want to invite you, if you've, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, if you've never received forgiveness from your mistakes, that opportunity is, is here today. And so if that's you and God is just kind of nudging your heart, uh, we're not going to do anything crazy or drawn out. I just want to invite you to raise your hand because I want to see and just be able to lead you in a prayer. If you're online, you can let one of our chat hosts know. Give just a few moments. If not, I just want to pray for our church. I want to pray for this world. Talk about evil and suffering, what we saw last night, the attacks on Jerusalem, the war that's going on in Israel, this unprecedented violence, it's, it's insane. It doesn't, it's not hard to see evil and suffering. The people of Israel, the people of Jerusalem are seeing that. There's people all over the world that are suffering immensely. And so I want to, Pray for us who are hurting in this room. Pray for the people online. And, uh, and pray for specifically for the people of Israel, for God's people. So let's pray right now. Lord, I lift up this church. I lift up everyone here who might be dealing with suffering and hurt. Lord, I thank you that your word answers our questions. But there are some that I'm waiting to ask you in person. Some that I'm just going to have to walk by faith and not by sight. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd continue to comfort us, that you'd guide us, that you'd mend our hearts, that you'd be close to us, that you'd be that Prince of Peace and that wonderful counselor. We pray for the Middle East right now, for the people of Israel. We pray for protection. Lord, we pray for Jerusalem. We pray that there would be peace in Jerusalem. We pray, God that people would turn to you. We pray that leaders, world leaders that could make a difference would turn to you. You are the answer. Lord, it sounds impossible. It sounds crazy to think that leaders of terrorist organizations could change, but I know nothing's impossible for you. The same God of miracles that can cure cancer and heal diseases can change the hearts of some of the people we think are the most evil. Lord, we pray, would you reveal yourself to them? Would you show them the love of Jesus? Would you show them the compassion of Jesus? We pray for believers there in the Middle East, Christians, people who follow Jesus. Lord, would you use them as your hands and feet to minister there, to bring comfort to people who see no hope? Would you remind them that there is light? And Lord, we look forward to the day where you will wipe the tears from our eyes and that we will be able to spend eternity with you. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.